you for putting this together. Listening to Vinay's introduction makes me realize that though this is a forum on bad education and the book is about bad education, we have a tough some remarkable students and some remarkable scholars who do remarkable things. And this book, which was started many years ago, long before the contemporary culture wars around education and educational possibilities were being waged in the form that they're being waged now, long before the neo-McCarthyism swept us all up in its grasp, um, though it are organized to generate a positive product. That product can simply be identified as meaning, values, understanding, knowledge. Something that is transportable and uh, measurable. That's why at Tufts for the past many uh, X number of years, all of you know that each department has to go through assessments. Assessments to see if you are learning, if, it's a, if there is some measurable standard by which we can see that you have had some value added to you by your <laughs> experience in the university. But the value added to you is not measurable in those terms. The value added to you is measurable in the degree to which you can resist the very quantification of your knowledge as those terms impose it upon you. So, though I don't believe that there are such things as queers, um, blacks, though I don't believe there are such things as blacks, um, uh, identities that are devalued come to represent. That is to say, the, the queer, the black, as this book argues, is a positivization, a substantialization, an attempt to materialize what is in itself conceptualized as other than the, as outside of or other than being, the non-being, the non-being within any order that must be materialized in order to then be excluded from it. You can't exclude non-being simply by calling it non-being. What you do is you find a figural substitution for non-being. You localize non-being. And then that figure of non-being can be cast out of the social order as if thereby you were purging the social order of the non-being that is inherent to that social order itself. So this is the logic that bad education follows. And it traces a variety of figures through a variety of texts, literary, cinematic, non-fictional. And if there is a hero, and I'm not sure that there is a hero of the book, but a figure who remains the sort of presiding figure of the book, it's Socrates. Not because Socrates had such great politics. I mean, one of the things that you know, we don't often get to think about is that one of the reasons that he was found guilty of worshiping gods foreign to the state and corrupting the young was actually a political vendetta because he supported the tyrants who overthrew the Greek democracy in Athens um, and uh, was, you know, in various ways complicit with that return of tyranny. But, so he's not, he's not a hero for his political stand. What he's a hero for is the fact that as Alain Badiou, the contemporary French philosopher would, philosopher would say, he recognized, in a certain sense, that the goal of education is precisely to corrupt the young. And Badiou insists that that is the goal of philosophy, but it's also the goal of the humanities, to corrupt the young, to teach them the things that the world does not want them to know, to teach them to think about the things that are tabooed by the structures of power that are put in place in order to shape the world as fixed and immutable. By teaching the young, by corrupting the young, by giving them a bad education, there's hope that the world can change. Now that change is not gonna be necessarily for the better, as we see in the case of Socrates. But it does mean that the change allows for the possibility of, uh, of movement. Not necessarily a movement that is going to avoid or escape the problems that bad education identifies, and I'm sure that Jess and I will be talking about that in a few minutes, but movement that is going to allow for different configurations of events to happen and for different people to occupy the place of non-being so that progress, in quotation marks, is never, as the liberal, our liberal friends would say, is never a sort of continuous movement toward the promised land of equity, equality, and inclusion. 
progress is only the serial mutation of who gets assigned the position of exclusion. And so those who are um, in a given social structure condemned to represent what is non-being may well, through certain interventions, democratic processes, militant revolution, whatever it may take, may overthrow the established structure and become capable of finding a space to register as beings in that world order. Um, the, it's particularly the kind of psychoanalysis, the school of psychoanalysis that is behind the book. And I think the easiest way to ask this is, I'm, I'm imagining people in the room, if they know anything about psychoanalysis, if they don't know a lot, they might think of it as sort of a kind of discourse that gets me in touch with my desires. It, it's something that, you know, I have pleasures that are hidden away, repressed somewhere, they come out in weird dreams every once in a while, but eventually I start talking with somebody about them, I realize them, I get in touch with my pleasure, I'm a fuller, more coherent, less neurotic person after psychoanalysis. I'm in touch with my pleasure. But that is only part of the story, because there's another version of psychoanalysis, or there's an extension, and that is named the drive. <laughs> so maybe we could talk about that. That pleasure turns out not to, pleasure and desire mm -hmm. turn out not to be the end of psychoanalysis. Sure, no, that's a great question. That's a great way of starting. Um, because let's start with psychoanalysis in general. When you say psychoanalysis, unless you're talking to a very select group of people, the immediate response, especially on the part of undergraduates, is Freud has been disproven, or you know, <laughs> has Freud been empirically shown to be true, or um, you know, isn't that so 19th century? And, and that's a good response. Mm -hmm. It's a good response because it makes it clear precisely what bad education is about. Freud, psychoanalysis, queer theory, um, critical race theory, all of them are consigned to the place of the nothing. Mm -hmm. They're consigned to the place of what doesn't count because they are interpretative sciences. And interpretation is precisely what the order of power wants to disallow. Tell me step by step how to program a computer and I'll give you, you know, I'll turn you into Elon Musk. I won't. Um, but, you know, if, if you can turn knowledge into a series of programmable steps, everything that Kant recoiled from, mm -hmm. um, then you are given the reward of power and prestige. But the interpretive sciences that will never be reducible to what chat GPT can do, uh, however many poems chat GPT may write, and however many undergraduate papers <laughs> chat GPT is currently writing, um, it will never succeed in interpreting, it will only succeed yeah. in reproducing. I mean, chat GPT is precisely the model that I was talking about that the neoliberal university is using on all of its, stu its students. Mm -hmm. It wants to turn them all into chat GPT, um, regurgitating what is known making the same material available over and over again, but prohibiting or restricting the possibility of placing any value in the analysis or interpretation of, in, of events, mm -hmm. especially the linguistic analysis of events. That's where psychoanalysis comes in. Because mm -hmm. psychoanalysis is the art of interpreting what refuses interpretation. Mm -hmm. When when you, the, the example you give of the sort of stereotype of the, you know, the, 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 the patient who goes to the analyst, lies down on the couch, tells the neurotic dreams that they have, and then thinks, you know, over a period of time, I'll have a conversation, then I'll understand, oh, I really wanted to kill my father and sleep with my mother, now I'm a happy, well-adjusted guy, and I go about my business. I mean, that's, that's not how it works. <laughs> it, the, you know, it's, it not only, in Lacanian psychoanalysis, but even in Freudian psychoanalysis, it, psychoanalysis is interminable. Mm -hmm. So if you're going into psychoanalysis, have a lot of money and a lot of time. <laughs> um, and don't expect to come out cured. Because the problem, the cure, would have to be the cure for being a subject. Mm -hmm. The problem from a psychoanalytic point of view is that you are a subject. So if you want to be cured, stop being a subject. Mm -hmm. There are only two ways of doing that. Psychosis and death. Um, one is cheaper, 
Yeah. I'm not sure which is cheaper. <laughs> <laughs> One is more certain. Um, the other is hard to do willfully. I mean, you know, it's, it, it happens to some people against their will, but most people can't willfully become what, One is cheaper for the state. <laughs> that is definitely yeah. true. Um, so no, the, the, the question of psychoanalysis is the question of confronting what in the subject itself remains perpetually unavailable to the subject itself, mm -hmm. what occupies the place of the nothing. Mm -hmm. And that place of the nothing is the place assigned to what can be called the unconscious, what can also be called the drive. Mm -hmm. Unlike pleasure, the drive is indifferent to our pleasure and pain. It's beyond the pleasure principle. And as I tell my students all the time, no one wants to believe in the drive, but everyone enacts the drive. And no one sees themselves enacting the drive. Everyone sees their friends enacting the drive. <laughs> so you know, you always see the, the good friend who neurotically and obsessively repeats the same mistakes, whether it be romantic mistakes or whether it be errors of judgment. They always wind up. However often you say, you know, you did that before, or that's not a good idea, they always wind up repeating things that don't make them happy. Yeah. And you say to yourself, gee, that's just sad. <laughs> uh, but of course, we're all doing that. That's what the drive is, because there is something within us that is not about making ourselves happy. It's about experiencing a certain sort of what Freud calls uh, uh, well, let, let's use the French. What Lacan calls jouissance, what we can call enjoyment, um, or, or ecstatic release. Mm -hmm. It's about um, a, 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 an impulse that is leading you beyond what you cognize as your own good. Because the you that is cognizing something as your own good is the conscious subject. It's you as you know yourself, it's your ego. But in addition to your ego, there's a, all sorts of other aspects of yourself whose good is not satisfied by getting a job at Tesla, whose good is not satisfied by being a STEM major, uh, or necessarily even by being an English major. There are all sorts of things that lead you to destruction, to, to behaviors that others can see as destructive, and that you simply see as inexplicable. But the thing that's hardest to accept is that those things are paths to your enjoyment. That the you that is enjoying them is not the you that is conscious of the pain they're causing. The you that's enjoying them is unconscious. And what the division in the subject is registering is the impossibility of making the pleasures of the conscious subject coincide with the drives of the unconscious subject. Excellent. And I mean, you know, certainly that division is something that, you know, as you rightly put it, we, we almost can't bear, and we, we don't bear, which is part of, I think, exactly where, where your book heads, because if we don't bear it, we project it. Exactly. Onto others, and that brings me to the next question. So because we, we can't deal with this drive within us, we have to come up with figures for it. And of course, the big figure is the queer, and we'll, we'll talk about some others in a minute, but I do want to talk about a, uh, a rhetorical term mm -hmm. that you use to, to uh, designate this figure. The, the rhetorical term is catacresis, and uh, if you look this up in a book, um, in a you know, rhetorical man do rhetorical manuals, you know, Quintilian, <laughs> uh, if you look it up in, in a book, one of the things you'll see about this figure is it's a figure of abuse. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I thought that that's sort of a resonant phrase for you, that it's a figure of abuse. And so maybe we could begin by sort of just defining what catacresis is, and then play on the figure of abuse uh, term for it. Absolutely. So catacresis, is when you take a term that properly, literally, belongs to one thing, but use it to name something else that doesn't have a proper name of its own. So when we talk about, I mean, these are the traditional figures that people discuss in referring to catacresis. When you talk about the face it in with the, the it fit into the ontological order such as you've understood it, like the foreigner, the immigrant, the transfigure. The queer, where queer is not an identity term. 
It's not the term for people who engage in any specific set of practices. Queer is a diacritical term for anything that a given social order experiences as foreign to, alien to, inassimilable to its registration of being. Mm -hmm. So that one is not queer, but one can be queered. And thus, queerness are, is the, the register of what has no name otherwise, which, which appears always in public spaces mm -hmm. as a form of bad education. Mm -hmm. That's what Ron DeSantis and, is so worried about. Uh, that's what they're worried about in Tennessee with the, the recently enacted ban on constitutional, as no doubt eventually after having destroyed several people's lives, it will be found to have been the ban on drag performances. Uh, the, you know, what, is, what it's actually saying is you do not have being mm -hmm. within this order, and if you appear within it, you are by virtue of your very appearance, by taking on the appearance of substantial being, you are corrupting the young. Mm -hmm. Your very presence is an act of corruption insofar as it refutes the order of reality as we are politically promulgating it. Mm -hmm. And therefore, you as the exclusion from ontology are disrupting the political truth of our ontology mm -hmm. and therefore must be excluded from it. Great, and so I mean, and, I mean, I think that takes us right to the, the next sort of set of questions, which are about the social and, and the political. And I mean, so you know, in the same way that if we weren't, you know, I feel I felt you know people are comfortable yeah, about absolutely. going after, of course. I mean, unless unless you're not, which <laughs> like whatever, who cares? But uh, but but I guess I bring this up because the the book is is has a critique of right identity politics, but it also has a critique of left identity absolutely. politics. And so, I mean, I think you've given us the right identity politics in the sense that the right creates figures that they exclude and then enjoy mm -hmm. from the, the enjoy the act of exclusion. But you also critique left identity mm -hmm. politics, which I think will discomfort all of us a little more. And so that's where we should be. So let's. Uh, what about the left identity politics? Well, the fantasy of the right is is much easier to critique because it's it's pure and simple. The right. The right knows so much more than the left in certain ways. The right knows that society is divided and it plays on divisions within society. Its goal is to, um, to, use those, to, to, to use those divisions, paradoxically, as the lever to create new divisions mm -hmm. and thus to open a space for ascent to power. Mm -hmm. The discourse of the left is the discourse of inclusion and it's the discourse of overcoming division. The problem with the discourse of the left, of course, is that it doesn't overcome division. Uh, its, its very goal of inclusion necessarily excludes those who are in favor of exclusion. So the, the position of exclusion is ineradicable. Mm -hmm. It's only the figures who are gonna occupy that position shift. So uh, in a left vision, we might well endorse from our own political positions those who will be excluded, the racist, the Nazi, the homophobe. But racists, Nazis, and homophobes are in fact articulating positions that simply don't coincide with our ontologies of what the order of being should look like. Mm -hmm. And therefore, to exclude them from our city on the hill, to imagine a city in which a sort of utopic world in which we would all get along, there would be no more dissension, is to imagine a fatal necropolis where thinking has ceased, where there's no possibility for dissent, which is exactly what the left, of course, is constantly insisting on, the virtues of dissent, the virtues of difference. That doesn't mean we have to agree with or tolerate the actions of Nazis or racists or homophobes, but it means that we have to think about what it means to want radically to exclude them. Mm -hmm. Excellent. And so I think also on that note, so you, you've mentioned it a couple times. So there, there are many cataclysmic figures for, for this nothing, right? Um, we've, we've been talking about queerness, but you have mentioned uh, the black as a figure, right? And, and so one of the things that this book does a little differently from No Future 
um, your previous book, right, um, is you're you're much more invested in questions now of race, right? And you, you I, I suppose you found uh, to use a term that might not perfectly fit a kinship, if you want, with Afro pessimism, right? Which is um, you know in many ways saying a lot of what you're saying about the queer, but instead about blackness, right? Um, and I'm curious about tensions there, because there is a case that some of these Afro pessimistic theorists. Um, talk about this, the, particularly Frank Wilderson, who you well know, talks this about uh, one of the, the founding planks of Afro-pessimism, what he calls the ruses of analogy. Mm -hmm. The idea that blackness, um, it can be compared to other kinds of minoritized racializations, right? For, for Wilderson, blackness is unique, it's special, it's not like other kinds of, uh, of uh, racializations that, that the body could bear. Um, so I can imagine a sort of a Wilderson or a Wilderson-like figure looking at this book and and recoiling a bit, right? Because you know you you've got a couple different catacristic figures, not exactly equalized but lined up. Um, what would you say to that figure? Well, I have so invented, of course, <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> well, I don't know if Wilderson himself is actually. But anyway, but yeah. <laughs> You know, Frank and I are in conversation about yeah. this, so it's it's it, uh, it's not something that he would be surprised at. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I guess I would go back. Start. I would start the question by going back in time to no future, which um, which preceded Wilderson's work on Afro pessimism. Right. And in certain ways, what Calvin Warren and Wilderson picked up on was the idea of a sort of possibility of affirming a negativity mm -hmm. that would not conduce to the reconstruction of a social order mm -hmm. to include the excluded. Mm -hmm. So when, when, when Frank and other Afro-pessimists are um, producing readings of blackness that want to establish blackness as unique in its uh, structural logic, mm -hmm. There are two things that I would say. The first is, yes, of course. The histories and the experiences of those who are identified as or who identify themselves as black are radically distinct from those who might experience themselves from outside of blackness as queer or who might experience themselves as brown, who might experience themselves as Asian, who might experience themselves as uh, uh, as trans, I mean, the, the, every designation of an excluded, delegitimized population will have its unique history, mm -hmm. and it will have its unique social circumstances that will affect how the experience of those persons unfolds in a given social order. Mm -hmm. But that's different from saying that those populations don't share the experience of a form of exclusion and delegitimation within a social order. The discourse of these highly vaunted and highly remunerated STEM, uh, STEM majors and, and um, disciplines um, <laughs> is, is a series of figures. Mm -hmm. It's, a, it's a, a vast operation of metaphoricity uh, that passes as non-metaphoric. And the failure to read metaphor there mm -hmm. is precisely because we think we live in a literal world. Mm -hmm. But there is no literal world. There are only worlds created through language, just as there are only queers or blacks created through language. You know, James Baldwin said, color is not a human or a personal reality, it's a political reality. And it's the interpretive imperative that we recognize in relation to artworks mm -hmm. that allows us then to use art as a canvas through which then to train our minds mm -hmm. to read what does not present itself as art, mm -hmm. but equally demands interpretive intervention. It does seem like the book... Um... It's true. I, I don't think that the argument requires self-reflexive artworks, though I suppose as a subset of that question, yeah. one could say what all work is not self-reflexive. Yeah, self self right? um, yeah. so, so some are, are more um, self-dramatizing as self-reflexive mm. works than others. 
Um, and, and those make up a fair number of the textual instances. Mm -hmm. But you know, Harriet Jacobs probably didn't think of herself as a self-reflexive artist. Um, oh, okay, well, <laughs> yeah. I mean, she, not that that matters whether yeah, she did or right. not. Um, but um, but I, but I, so I don't think that the argument is specific only to self uh, mm -hmm. to self dramatizing self reflective art, but I do think that one of the things that the self reflective moment in art allows us to understand, and again this probably goes back to all of your courses, mm -hmm. is the way in which that distance from itself enacts the divisions that necessarily allow for certain. Um, figural logics to become apparent mm -hmm. in order to produce the illusion of a reality. Mm -hmm. And thus the, the creation of a world, the framing of an ontological order that can pass as the order of being mm -hmm. without, without it registering as being an aesthetic constru construction is visible in those self-reflexive, self-dramatizing self-reflexive words mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. thus allow us more easily to mm -hmm. extend them into readings of the um, non-ontological, non-literal mm -hmm. status of the world we call reality. Mm -hmm. Well, so maybe we can. Um, we, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> maybe we, actually, because I do, I want to make sure um, openly that um, bad education might not be what people think it is. Because there's a way in which um, Michael Haneke's Funny Games, if people don't know, it's, it's, a, it's a movie where two, two queer figures, serial killers of some kind, terrorize a young suburban family, um, are constantly kind of winking at the screen. It's, 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 it's very meta, draws attention to itself as an artifact. Um, but Michael Haneke, when he was asked, you know, why did he make this movie, quite provocatively says, I wanted to, I want, and sorry, this is what he says, I wanted to rape the viewer into freedom. I wanted the viewer to, to not be hypnotized by the, uh, the work of cinema. I wanted them to see behind it. And there's a way in which you could say, for a moment, is that bad education? I mean, it's making us see behind the images that are projected to us. It's making you see the meaningless thing behind it. But that is not, you, you disagree with Haneke. So maybe, could we talk about that a little bit? That there's a moment where you and Haneke almost seem to be on the same page, but then you go in a completely different direction. Yeah, because bad education is not about lifting the veil right. and seeing the truth. There's a name for that process. It's called allegory. Mm -hmm. An allegory is when something appears to be one thing and then you um, recognize that in fact this was standing for something else and the truth is only accessible once you're able to read through the mm -hmm. figures. Mm -hmm. Allegory is the villain of bad education mm. because allegory is the logic of education itself. Um, the, so if, if just to, to make big things small <laughs> and long things short, if you wanted to produce a summary version of what allegory is, allegory would be like the words in the hymn, I once was blind, but now I see. Um, the moment you enacted in a certain uh, order of meaning, inevitably. Did you ask, was your question, is an anti-essentialist project or is an anti-essentialist political project? Political project. Uh, no. Okay. The, the short answer is no. I mean, the problem with politics is politics is always about positivization. Um, this was fantastic. Thank you so much. And Professor Kaiser, thank you for beautiful moderation. Um, I'm just so happy I came. I wanted to ask you, Professor Edelman, about the affective atmosphere of a bad education. Um, as you talk about irony, optimism, pessimism, um, what is the what is the the right attitude? What is the right space? Are we you know you just said you're allowed to enjoy friends, right? You're allowed to enjoy learning, um, but I'm just thinking of the the kinds of disaffections I see in as I teach gender and sexuality studies, right? And disappointment, but also the the opportunity for effusive embodiment as well. And 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 so what is what is uh, and and I'm also thinking about Sarah Ahmed's. Uh, feminist killjoy, right? Mm -hmm. So, so what, what, when we think about the embodiment of a bad education, what does that look like in, in its affective registers um, between educators and students as well? Thanks, Karina. It's a, it's a wonderful question. I, 
It's a, it's a huge question also, because there are so many different aspects to it. One of the things that I think that your question is perhaps getting at is when you look at the affective experience, especially of undergraduate students in this historical moment, especially around questions of gender, sexuality, race, privilege, and power, what you recognize is that there are two countervailing forces at work. One is the experience of a certain profound, uh, what my, friend, my late friend Lauren Berland called, political emotion of depression. And the other is the experience of a profound will to assert one's own knowledge of the political truth. And those are two sides of the same coin. You know, the, one, the latter is what gets parodied as the, the terrorism of the woke student. And the former is the deep sense of despair out of which that uh, potentially Stalinistic turn emerges. And the question is, how can you confront both of those things at the same time without offering naive representations of a hope that is only the sort of hope that is ultimately offered by someone like the Grand Inquisitor in Dostoevsky's The Brothers Karamazov. You know, let's not tell them how bad it really is, because if they knew how bad it is, they couldn't take it. So our job, it seems to me, is not to be the Grand Inquisitor, um, but rather to be those who allow students to experience affectively their depression with the enjoyment, not of a sort of Stalinistic terrorization of those who might say the wrong thing or not uh, know the right words at the right moment, but with the enjoyment of being collaborators in a process, which is the process of trying to think through the situation not to solve the situation, not to cure the situation, not necessarily even to survive the situation. We're not gonna survive the situation. We don't know if our country is gonna survive the situation. We don't know if our country should survive the situation. What we do know is that globally, we are experiencing a moment where not just right-wing forces, but self-declared fascist forces have taken power in nation states around the world, very nearly successfully conducting a revolution in ours, which probably will be completed in 2024. Um, and we have to, it seems to me as educators, allow our students to face that and to let them know that it's been faced before. It's not unique. No one's situation of terror, though unique to them, is unique in history. And that one of the things that we can do is think together about how works of art, about works of history, and how philosophy allows us to say there will be times when the world will be ending and where it's up to you to figure out what to do in order to preserve not just the English major, not just the humanities, but what we think of as the values of humanity. Excellent. So, um, as you know, Lee, yes. all objects are lost, yes. uh, but Sonia found the thing, and it's in the box <laughs> out there, <laughs> and I think we're, yeah. Yes, so... <laughs> 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 Are you on <laughs> 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 <laughs>